Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, super uh, incredibly excited to be here and also moderate this amazing panel. Um, before I start, I'd like to just make a quick introduction of myself. So this is Sue. Um, I lead finance and operation at the StarkNet Foundation. Um, prior to that, um, for the first 10 years of my career, I was an investment banker, helping companies go public and also making strategic decisions based in Asia. So I work with companies like Alibaba and big uh, Far East tech companies. Uh, and then the next five years, I was uh, doing deep tech investment in China. And also, I was a CFO of an uh, AI-based um, company. So I joined the foundation about uh, half a year ago, and obviously very, very um, excited and also start peeled. So, <laughs> so before um, we start, why don't we just make a quick introduction of our uh, panelists? Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Jill Gunter. I'm a co-founder, and I'm also chief strategy officer at Espresso Systems. Uh, we're a company that's working on building a shared decentralized sequencer network for rollups to be able to leverage to gain uh, interoperability, decentralization, um, and still be able to maintain the properties that their users love, like fast pre-confirmations. Uh, hi, guys. My name is Vitaly. Uh, I'm the co-founder and CTO of company ZKX. Uh, if you are at any groups in Telegram of Stackware, Stacknet, you probably know me as Bitpactum. Um, ZKX uh, is uh, permissionless uh, decentralized DEX, perpetual swaps on Starknet, but that's not the reason why I'm here today, obviously. Today I'll be talking about how we've managed to scale uh, Starknet with uh, on-chain and off-chain um, permissionless arbitrary computation. I'm Nick White. I'm the COO at Celestia Labs, and we're building Celestia, which is the first modular blockchain network. Uh, it's a layer one blockchain that just focuses on consensus and data availability. So our goal is to provide uh, very scalable, trust-minimized block space for people to build rollups uh, and modular blockchains on top of. So... So early days of blockchain brought us the monolithic systems where the from consensus to data availability, execution and settlement happens all tightly together in one layer. Now um, this monolith, uh, mono, modular approach is now, you know, each of these uh, companies focusing on one area is in providing um, uh, best uh, you know, execution in certain areas. So why don't I start the question by, you know, define what is a modular blockchain and what is you know, from the philosophical and technical point of perspective. Yeah, so I think from my perspective, uh, modularity is really about giving developers more options, um, allowing developers to own not just their application software, but to own and uh, be able to define the roadmap for and the design choices for uh, the full underlying architecture. And I think that we're seeing more and more need for this as we see uh, more experimentation in the types of applications that are being built, whether it's kind of world building and gaming applications that are developing their own rollups or building on rollups, uh, whether it's, uh, of course, you know, DeFi and kind of payments and, and the financialized kind of universe of applications, um, or indeed, you know, social networking apps, obviously. Friend.tech is, is getting a lot of hype right now. Farcaster is another great protocol. Uh, building in that space. And all of these different areas have different user bases, have different user needs, um, and therefore might have different needs around, again, what the different components of their whole stack look like. So whether that's a different choice of trade-off in terms of uh, throughput and latency with the security of the protocol and decent level of decentralization of the protocol that they're using, whether that's wanting to make different choices for data availability to reduce costs for their users and foregoing posting all of the data to the Ethereum L1. Um, it's these types of things that come up when I talk to developers about the benefits of, of modularity to them. Um, I, I'll defer to my other members on stage here to see if they would add anything to that because I do think everyone has a slightly different take on this. Thank, thank you, Jill. Uh, for me, it's more about technical possibilities. In, in many ways, Web3 has the same principles as Web2 in the way how it grows, in the way how we uh, advance the technology. 
a uh, few years ago, five years ago, when you do web, web free development, web free projects, you won't follow normal principles. There may be no QA. Uh, there is nothing that you've used in traditional web two developments. But now things start to change, and uh, web free as the industry and the technology grows and grows massively. In the same way, how you we've seen in traditional developments uh, change from monolithic approach into super isolated microservices uh, that was done through the uh, requirements and desire to build better systems, a better architecture, we see how blockchain as an industry moves towards the same, same, uh, same type of architecture. Lots of things can be done in a monolithic way, and very often it's quicker and easier, but if you really want to unlock ability to build architecture that is super flexible, that gives uh, best of both worlds in terms of uh, different interoperability or different types of blockchains or different types of modular systems, the, the modular and isolated approach is, is the only way forward. And this unlocks a lot in terms of what can be done now much faster in, in a better way. I, I really like both your guys' answers. And um, building off of what Jill said about Modularity gives more choice and freedom to developers to build um, the kind of on the stack that best suits their application. I think another another aspect of that is um, modular blockchains also can provide more scale because they use technologies like data availability sampling, which allow you to increase the size of blocks with the number of nodes in the network. So for the first time, we can have blockchains that don't have a fixed block size but can continue to grow as more people join the network and run nodes. And so that allows us to escape from this like world of, of scarce block space where which Ethereum has kind of been trapped in. Like imagine if Ethereum didn't have this constraint of, of really high gas fees, like how much faster it could grow. Um, so that, that's one point that is also uh, big. And, and aside from data availability sampling is, is rollups, which allow people to um, verify the execution of a blockchain very efficiently. Um, and I think a, a really good sort of analogy to explain what modular, the modular stack is like is it's very similar to the cloud architecture in, in Web2, where in um, cloud architectures you have like a data center that provides raw compute, and then developers come to that platform and they say, I want to consume this resource, and I'm going to deploy a virtual machine, uh, to like a, a customized virtual machine on top of your uh, data center that's tailored to my, my application. I can scale it up and down on demand. Um, it's very similar in the, the uh, modular Web3 stack where you have a data network like Celestia or Ethereum providing just raw block space and data availability. And then developers come and deploy a virtual blockchain, which is a, a roll-up um, that they can customize. And, um, and it's customized to their application. And they can scale it up and down and, and consume these resources on demand. So like, it's. Uh, I think the parallels there are, are really uh, striking and to me are kind of a confirmation that this is the right architecture for the long term because it's worked in Web2. Got it. So can you tell me a little bit more, well, can you share a little bit more about what solutions that you are providing in terms of the characteristic that we just talked about? Yeah, so what uh, I and, and my company, Espresso Systems, are specifically working on is the sequencing layer of the stack. Um, and so if you think about the uh, development of rollups over the last four or five years, uh, really rollups have come from this idea of sharding um, in, in a sense and being able to scale through having uh, different applications using different sort of areas or domains almost of, of block space. Um, and there have been great successes that have come from that. Uh, you know, huge credit to uh, the folks at Starkware and around the whole ecosystem um, for kind of pioneering this, uh, but you know, lots of other examples of rollups uh, showing success as well. Of course, in terms of getting great adoption and and offering uh, developers again that you know sort of cheaper, more abundant block space that they couldn't find on the L1, and then again having a much better user experience for their end users. What they've sacrificed in many cases, however, is number one, interoperability uh, between the rollups. 
Um, and I think as more and more rollups arise and also L3s and so forth arise, we're going to see this as an increasing question of, well, are we just relying on bridges then to get, you know, cross-domain atomicity or, you know, composability? Um, how, do we, how do we resolve this? And then the second thing that many of these architectures have sacrificed for now, although it's on all of their roadmaps, is decentralization. Um, and specifically, the thing that I'm concerned about is decentralization of the sequencer component of their stack. So a sequencer is responsible for, as it suggests, sequencing transactions and proposing that sequence of transactions. Um, that's actually a very important part of, of the system um, and can threaten uh, you know, the functioning of the system, the safety and the liveness of the system, um, at, at a minimum, it can make it very expensive for users to get their transactions through if the sequencer is engaging in some kind of censorship. Um, and so, again, what, what we're thinking about, again, is these sort of twofold problems of interoperability, decentralization, and that's where the espresso sequencer comes in, is creating an option for roll-up developers to be able to have enhanced interop with other roll-ups who've adopted us, and also to have an option uh, to decentralize that component of their stack without just having to go in and build it themselves. Building a roll-up is hard enough uh, as it is. So in a sense, we're, we're very much playing into this theme of modularity, um, and this again is why I think of it as really providing more optionality uh, to developers. If rollup developers choose to use Ethereum as a decentralized sequencer, which is also totally something that you can do, that might be a valid choice for some applications, but we think that for many, it will make a lot more sense uh, to outsource that to a shared and differentiated consensus protocol, which is what we've built. For, for us at ZKX, it goes beyond the traditional uh, classical blockchain applications and approaches. Um, very quickly how we got here. Uh, when we started developing the Perpetual Swaps uh, DEX uh, a few years ago, the idea was that it has to be fundamentally uh, decentralized, permissionless, and it has to be order book based. As, as you all know, order book is the very technically challenging task. It has to be fast, it has to be reliable, the latency should be as, as little as possible, and uh, it doesn't go well with words permissionless and digitalization. Uh, however, having these three principles as the uh, founding stones, we had to find a way to somehow deliver this. And we realized that using traditional uh, tools that are available to developers, it's absolutely impossible to do that. So for us, the first step was to solve the task of how how it's even possible to create the order book which is decentralized and uh, permissionless. Uh, we've managed to create a, a node network that does a lot of very uh, cool and smart stuff, but initially it was just about this particular task, how you can match orders in decentralized, permissionless way. And about a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago, uh, every time when I was on stage, I was talking about Cairo, I was talking about how we can onboard developers to StarkNet, but also, as a side note, I, I've been mentioning that, guys, this is what we've managed to achieve with the help of L2 and with the help of uh, StarkNet. Uh, this is how it works. I'm, I was super excited initially about just the idea of ability to decentralize the order book. But very often, I have, uh, I've, I've seen developers coming to me asking, is, a, uh, is it just for order book or is it something more than that? Can we run this type of uh, computation in, in, in um, uh, proved way and uh, uh, can you verify it? Can you validate it? Can we try this? Can we do image generation? Can we do this uh, big data lake approach? Uh, and through the developers coming uh, to me and talking to me about what they need, uh, what I've realized personally is that when you talk about Web3 in the same way how you talk about Web2, you at the moment was limited to the boundaries of the existing technology that sits within the blockchain. So in the same way how in Web2, if you want to build something massive, you have to utilize existing protocols, you have to utilize your existing formats and standards, but within the blockchain, it just was not an option. And through that, we've extended our proposition to make sure that effectively we can run effectively any type of arbitrary computation on top of any L2, in our case, a StarkNet solution. And I think that the future is absolutely modular, but the future is not limited within the just the block space. Blocks are important, 
blockchains are important, but ability to plug in external things with in verifiable and validatable way is important. And this is what we're trying to do at ZKX. So um, the, I think the question was about like what, what does our specific project um, do in the modular stack? And Celestia is focused on the, the base layer of the modular stack, sort of like the foundation of um, like security in the modular stack. And that is consensus and data availability. So um, and it's, it's a kind of like the role that, for example, Ethereum plays um, when, when someone deploys a roll up on Ethereum, they're, they're borrowing consensus and data availability from Ethereum. So most people know what consensus is. It's um, just how you order data or transactions. And so you need a bunch of validators to vote on that order. And then once you have a, like a quorum in, in a proof of stake uh, consensus at least, um, you, have like a, uh, you can consider that uh, ordering finalized. And then when you have that view, people can then you know, compute over that or execute those transactions. And that's what rollups do. But you also need not just that ordering, you need something called data availability. And what data availability is, a better name for it might be something like data publishing. Um, because what you need is you need people to be able to verify or confirm that all the, the transaction data uh, has been published to the network so that people can download it. Because the security model of, of rollups requires that uh, the data is transparent. So we need, we need like, the, the block data in all blockchains needs to be public information. And um, it sounds really simple, like, or, and, and, like, you wouldn't really need to do anything to make that possible. But the, um, the problem is the naive way of making, sh making it so that people can verify that block uh, data has been published and is available is they have to download all of that block data. And then they can say, okay, yeah, I've seen all the block data, therefore it's been published. Um, but that doesn't scale because as the amount of transactions grows, then uh, every node that wants to verify the chain would have to download that much more data. And so, you know, when there's only maybe a few kilobytes or megabytes of transactions in every block, that's fine. But if we want to scale to millions and in the future billions of people, the block sizes are going to be orders of magnitude bigger, like on the order of gigabytes potentially. And not everyone's going to be able to download that. They're not going to have a fast enough um, internet connection. And so what Celestia does is it uses a new technology called data availability sampling, which enables people to verify that all the data has been published um, by just sampling a very small amount of the overall data. So it could be a, a block of a gigabyte, and you could verify that all the data has been published by only downloading a few kilobytes. Of, of data. So this enables us to scale block sizes massively and to kind of like get past this root bottleneck of onboarding more people to Web3 and uh, having cheaper transactions for, for everyone. So I guess now that we are talking about the data availability, um, a very good example of monolithic approach and modular approach is probably the approach by Celestia and the EIP 4844. So in that context, and especially the 4844 coming up, what will be the Celestia's um, position when, in a world where Ethereum offers that services? So um, Ethereum uh, has an upcoming EIP 4844, which will add a specific like, data availability blob space to the, each Ethereum block. And um, that's specifically for, for rollups. Uh, however, that blob space is going to be uh, quite small at the beginning. And I think the demand for block space from all these rollups in the Ethereum ecosystem and beyond is much bigger. And so um, Celestia, because we have implemented data availability sampling, we can actually uh, scale to much greater block sizes. So we'll be able to augment the available block space for rollups. And luckily, uh, we fortunately, we can also help uh, rollups that want to settle to Ethereum, they can use Celestia as off-chain data availability because we have a bridge that um, allows people to verify that data has been published on Celestia on Ethereum. So we're also going to help the uh, Ethereum community scale uh, that way. Got it. So um, I, I guess from the builder's perspective, it's very clear you know, I don't have to worry about sequencer building validator sets and, you know, take components from each of your services and, you know, I focus on what I'm good at and building the services. 
um, then from the user perspective, does it impact, for example, in the in a case of shared sequencer, um, you know, the transaction uh, from different protocol, then your user experience is impacted by whatever protocol has the latest finality or execution. So does that impact, is there any trade-off between the user experience in terms of latency and getting finality versus you know, decentralized sequencer? Yeah, this is one of the first things that we hear from roll-up teams that we work with, which is that, well, you know, now I kind of have this problem where all of my end users are accustomed to the centralized experience that a centralized sequencer and an overall centralized architecture can offer. Low latency, low fees, high throughput. Um, you know, uh, they, all of these roll-up teams know that they're going to have to migrate off of that at some point, and they all have it on their roadmaps that they will decentralize. But they want to make that as painless as possible for their end users. So we've put a lot of thought into what our consensus protocol will look like. Um, and we've chosen to use an optimistically responsive consensus protocol, uh, which basically means that under optimistic network conditions, hopefully most of the time, um, with the robustness of the networks that we have in crypto and blockchain today, uh, users will be able to still have very fast pre-confirmations of their transactions and very low fees and very high throughput, but we still have a fallback, basically. And this is a different set of trade-offs from, for example, the Ethereum consensus. Um, the Ethereum consensus protocol rightly makes trade-offs that um, make it work to uh, be highly robust, um, even in the most adversarial conditions, and therefore they have to you know, give up on some of the uh, optimistically responsive um, uh, characteristics that I'm describing. But to me, this again kind of is a good example of the beauty of modularity where in, you know, we can make and Celestia can make and other ledgers can make very different design choices from those that the Ethereum core developers have, again, rightly had to take uh, over the years. Nick, I'm sure you have thoughts on that when it comes to DA as well. We, we are in a slightly different business. Uh, we have Espresso doing uh, sequencing. We have uh, data publishing in Celestia. We are in business of providing uh, computation layer. Uh, if you would right now want to build something in a decentralized way, if you want to do the image generation, if you want to do the mass data analysis, if you want to run the, the ML, right now the only easier way to do that is to, do, to be fully centralized. You spin up another cluster at AWS, put the server on, put your code on, and it works. But if you have to be, either through the legislation or through your desire to give power and control to your users, if you want to do something in a decentralized way and you want to have high efficiency, high performance computation with a lot of data in a, sta in a stateful format, there's literally nowhere you can go right now. And you can do it yourself, you can, run, you can spin your own node network and you can run the, the codes, but it means that 80% of your time will be spent on infrastructure that you have to build even before you start writing your own code in your own application. So we are in the business of providing this decentralized computation layer. And then obviously we benefit with, of the uh, data publishing services and, and sequencing. It, it has to be there. But we see ZKX role in the modular space in a slightly different, different formats. We, we are the module that provides computation that usually won't be possible to do within the block space, within the typical blockchain. Um, so I guess to Nick, um, so in the case of Starknet, we, our sequencer does the consensus as well as the execution. And by separating this consensus and, you know, DA, potentially it could also add complexity to the, you know, the operator. So now I have to think about, you know, does it necessarily speed off my task or does it add more complexity by, you know, segregating these components and does that make sense? Yeah, I think you're kind of touching on the, the question of like, does the fact that you have more choice lead to more complexity for the developer experience? Um, and I think that um, the modular stack gives you the choice to engage and build something that's more complex if you want to and if that is what you need to do. But it doesn't mandate that you go into the guts and make all these 
really uh, sort of like in-depth protocol level types of changes. Um, I, I would say there is a lot more choice, so you do kind of have to like figure out which components you want to use, but um, there are lots of really like easy just, hey, here's a vanilla EVM roll-up, boom, you know, you can deploy it in like less than a minute um, types of solutions. And so I think that's, um, that really dramatically reduces the, um, the complexity for the developers. But the nice thing is that, and you can also deploy as a smart contract on a modular general purpose roll-up. Um, but the nice thing is once you, if you do have the need to like customize your stack, you can do that. And that's, that's what the superpower of modular blockchains is. Great, thank you. Um, now the time's up, so any closing remarks or anything you would like to share? Yeah, I mean, I imagine that a lot of you are either interested in kind of roll-up infrastructure or are developing applications on StarkNet, and um, yeah, I would just encourage you to check out all three of our projects. Um, you can find us on Twitter at EspressoSys, S-Y-S. Um, or at espressosys.com is our website. Um, and yeah, we are excited about supporting, particularly probably to begin with, L3s in the StarkNet ecosystem um, with the sequencer product, uh, probably, hopefully, uh, sometime early in the new year. So if it sounds interesting, please do get in touch. Um, I think that blockchain space and this technical stack is maturing now, and things that we've didn't even think possible a year ago are now possible, which means make me think that what will be possible in a year's time. And future is definitely modular. We'll have more and more things that will plug in into the uh, ecosystem, into the uh, technology. And I think that if you see some, if you see a problem right now, you think that you can't solve this problem with the traditional approach or architecture, there is definitely a way. Maybe we don't know it yet, uh, but if we have amazing developers in the ecosystem, as we have in, with the StarkNet, the lots of things that we think that right now are impossible will be resolved. And yes, please do, I encourage every one of you, check our projects in the future is modular. Uh, my closing remarks are just that we're very close to launching Mainnet. We have um, some really exciting launch partners. Um, and after we launch Mainnet and the network is live and we uh, kind of uh, the next milestone that we've set for ourselves uh, is to scale to gigabyte blocks, um, to have a million rollups deployed, and to have a billion light nodes on uh, people's phones throughout the world. And this is a very grand goal. Each of those is very uh, ambitious, but we think it's possible, and uh, it's a future that we want to create because that is, to me, like the end game for, for crypto adoption um, is having massive scale, having you know tons and tons of different applications deployed, and then having end users around the world verifying the chain directly. So um, if you're excited about that vision, um, get in touch with us. Uh, we would love to help you you know build in the modular stack in the modular ecosystem, whether directly on Celestia or with uh, the various teams that we're in touch with, like Espresso, and um, yeah, uh, we are on Twitter at Celestia Org, and um, uh, love to hear from you. Great, thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you.